Hello everybody, it's Peter. Peter with an I, S-T-A-W-A-R-T. Welcome to segment 22 of... I don't know, the Dark Tower, I guess? Chapter 21 You guys went over to some girl's house? Asked Joe, looking out the window of the car as they drove along. He tried to sound cool with the fact that he was left out of things. Charles and Chauncey agreed not to say anything to him about their little adventure earlier, but Charles just let it slip out. Oh, we just had to drop something off, lied Chauncey. Joe felt the vibes not to inquire, so he didn't. He switched gears and asked, So, how many people are going to be at the party tonight? Charles and Chauncey ignored him. It's just that he was so unimportant that when he spoke, listening and acknowledging was an agonizing chore. And his words were as easily tuned out as elevator music. Charles tried to remember why they were bringing him to this party in the first place. Oh yeah, Joe, instead of having the brandy in the base, go ahead and put it in this cup, he said. As Joe brought out the brandy, and Charles held the end steady while he squirted it in an empty arctic flush cup, Joe felt good that Charles was working with him on a task, instead of just ignoring him. After a while, they arrived at Bear's house. Joe got all excited seeing the different cars that were parked in the lot. He knew exactly who they belonged to because the people who owned them were very cool. I heard Soleil is supposed to be at this party tonight, said Charles. Joe got all excited. She was absolutely beautiful. Joe wondered whether or not he could ever have a chance with her. I heard she's getting married to a dentist, replied Charles. Guess not, thought Joe. They made their way inside. The place was run of the mill. There was no special architecture. It wasn't particularly big. The furniture was pretty standard. But to Joe, it had a kind of magical quality to it. They greeted a few people on their way in. It was pretty mellow, just a few people hanging out together. Through Joe's special spectrum, important, exciting things were going on at this place. Before Joe had a chance to shut the door behind him, a cat came running into the house. Charlotte, the same girl who was at the movie theater earlier, knelt down to play with it. Oh, hello, my precious little sweetums, she said in a gushing motherese. Oh, hi, replied Joe as a little joke. Charlotte looked up with a smile, thinking it was either Charles or Chauncey that had said it. But when she saw it was just some nobody, her smile turned to dog pile, and the cat got scared and ran away. Joe followed Chauncey and Charles into the next room where they were saying hello to their old friend, Soleil. She seemed melancholy. Joe didn't know her personally, but he thought that this was a good time to make the connection. When he asked her if she needed anything from the kitchen, she almost wanted to cry. Soleil had been living about an hour away, but a world apart from her old crowd. Away from Charles and Chauncey and all the other people who were there that night. The house she was living in belonged to a dentist, whose next door neighbor was a professional basketball player, and there were fancy cars in every driveway along the street. In that neighborhood, she felt she was among people who were so much more important than her old friends and the small hillbilly world they lived in. <laughs> it was like she resided in a city in the clouds with ivy-covered castles whose gilded banners fluttered in the wind. And when she pressed a button on the drawbridge opener, it would come down slowly over the moat and Pegasus would be parked there ready to fly. If Frank were there, he'd warn her about letting Ivy grow for too long because it gets a foothold and she'll need some antimatter to get that stuff off. She felt like she was cast down to a house with cat fur on the rug filled with shiftless people. 
and now Pencil Neck Joe was asking her if she needed anything from the kitchen. She wanted to cry because his world was so insignificant and he didn't even realize it. His clothes weren't even expensive. You know, complained Charlotte to her boyfriend as they stood in the entryway. That was really inappropriate what he said. I mean, it was obvious I was talking to the cat. And when he said, hello there, it was really uncalled for. Well, what do you want me to do about it? He asked, wanting to please her. She huffed. She was so frustrated that the guy she was dating wasn't more of a boyfriend and didn't understand the role of being a boyfriend. A boyfriend isn't supposed to ask, what do you want me to do about it in this type of situation and make her say exactly what she wants? The boyfriend is supposed to get all hot-headed, stomp over, and beat the hell out of the guy for displeasing his woman. And if other people were to speak up and tell her that it just wasn't right for some innocent guy to get beaten to a pulp, she could say, well, I don't believe that fighting is the answer, but he really deserved it. That's what a boyfriend is supposed to do. In Charlotte's mind, he's also supposed to say mean and disparaging things during an argument so that she could tell her friends how she's been to hell and back from an abusive relationship, and they're supposed to be impressed. She can also tell teachers at school, well, the reason I didn't show up for two weeks and went shopping at the mall the whole time was because I was in a really abusive relationship. Can I at least get a B? If that doesn't quite do the trick, she can claim that when she told her boyfriend she was pregnant, he laughed and dumped a filthy ashtray over her head. Now that would impress her friends. Hey Joe, said Charles. Come on. Charles, Chauncey, and a few other guys escorted Joe out. Charlotte's boyfriend was relieved to see Joe exit the room. He was about going to have to approach the guy and say, Hey, dude, I'm really sorry, but I'm going to have to kick your ass. He looked over and saw Charlotte getting in an argument with some other guy. He decided that what Charlotte needed was a wand. She could point that wand at people, and they'd get their ass kicked. She could walk down the street, and anyone who she didn't like the looks of would fall to their knees and go, Ugh! Or, These guys who Joe had just met were getting along with him great. They were excited about him and his brandy. And they went on and on telling stories about how they drank hard whiskey all the time. This one guy claimed that he would stay drunk for weeks on end. Joe was making all these friends and decided that the brandy had really become a great tool for meeting new people and forming solid bonds. <laughs> Chapter twenty two. On their way back from the movie theater, Frank told Potty Mouth everything. He had told him how he had been infatuated with the cup, and how the end to his love was nowhere in sight. It was somewhere on the far side of the ocean. Potty Mouth told him some tangential story about how he had once gotten hepatitis from an exotic fruit, and how it gave him an infection that made it look like a certain body cavity was producing cottage cheese. He had set out to illustrate some point on infatuation, but the example of the cheese was so shocking, the point of the story became lost. Both he and Frank left the theater with lumps on their heads. They both knew that fighting is wrong, and it's more ethical to get beat up, but they were both out of control. It turned out to be a bonding experience. Frank listened to his story about the forbidden passion fruit with a little more interest. As they entered the house, laughing and talking about the events of the struggle and the strategies they used, Frank switched on the lamp. 